Hi everyone, today we're going to learn about another sort of AC motor. It's called the AC induction motor, sometimes called the squirrel cage motor, for reasons that will become clear in a moment. So an induction motor is a special sort of motor where the rotor is moved by changing the strength and direction of the magnetic field across it. Now that's a bit different, isn't it? Most of the motors that we've dealt with so far have a static magnetic field, or at least a magnetic field that's always moving back and forth in the same direction. Uh, so an induction motor is different to AC and DC motors. So in AC and DC motors we change the current through the rotor, whereas in AC induction motors we change the magnetic field across the rotor. Make sense? So let's look at how they work. In an AC induction motor, we use a three-phase uh, power source, or three-phase alternating power source, in order to make three pairs of electromagnets turn on and off in sequence, like we can see in this lovely animation here. We can see that as we turn the electromagnets on and off, we produce a magnetic field through the, uh, through the stator of the motor. So this will generate a rotating magnetic field that always passes across the center of the motor. We can see that in this case, the magnetic field is changing in a clockwise direction. So the center of the motor is where we'll always get a changing magnetic field, and this is where we'll want to place the rotor. So what we need is a squirrel cage rotor stuck right in the middle of the uh, three sets of electromagnets. We call it a three-phase induction motor because we have three different directions that the magnetic field can be in. It can be in this direction, or in this direction, or it can be vertical. There are other sorts of induction motors that use uh, more than three phases, but this can be difficult uh, to do because the more phases we have, the more complicated circuitry we need in order to run these electromagnets in sequence. So, what does the squirrel cage rotor look like? Well, in real life, it might look something like this. It's a rotor that consists of a number of aluminium or copper bars that join together two conducting rings. If we were to draw a schematic version of it, it might look something like this. We have two rings and a number of bars joining them. And we can see now why we might call this a squirrel cage right? It looks almost like a cage in which you might trap a small furry animal. So the bars are usually encased in a laminated iron armature. So in this picture, for example, it's quite difficult to spot the squirrel cage. Now, why might we encase the bars in a laminated iron armature? Well, that's the iron core of the rotor, right? So the rotating magnetic field will induce currents in the bars of the rotor, but not in the laminated iron armature. The laminations mean that it's very difficult for electric currents to appear in the iron. So we get uh, electric currents running through the bars and the rings of the squirrel cage rotor. So how exactly will these currents interact with the changing magnetic field, do you think? Well, we know from Lenz's law that when a, when a changing magnetic field induces currents, those currents will create their own magnetic field which opposes the change in flux, right? So the rotor will try and stop rotating relative to the changing magnetic field. Well, but what this means is that if it stops rotating relative to the field and the field itself is rotating, that means that the rotor will be rotating at the same rate as the magnetic field rotates. Now its maximum rate of rotation will be when it's completely lined up with that magnetic field. And in that case, the rate of rotation, that is the frequency of the motor, will be exactly the same as the frequency of the AC power source, which sounds something, uh, which sounds kind of familiar, 
That's the same as the brushed standard AC motor, right? We learned about that in the last section. Now, whenever a motor's power is being used to do work, the motor slows down. Makes sense, right? If it's doing work, then whatever it's trying to turn is resisting being turned. And when this happens, the motor will lag behind uh, slightly the, uh, the input signal, causing it to rotate. The construction of the squirrel cage and the multiple bars means that the squirrel cage rotor will never stop turning, although we can't prevent it from slowing down. In an induction motor, the rate at which it, uh, the rotor lags behind the input uh, frequency of the power source is called the slip of the motor. So it's like the rotor is slipping behind a bit. Now the slip of the motor is normally given as a fraction or as a percentage. And what does the fraction mean? Well, it shows how much the motor has slowed down from its maximum speed. So usually the slips on a large induction motors are quite small, in general less than about 5%. At very small slips, uh, an induction motor will produce even more torque than when it's unloaded. When it's spinning at exactly the same rate as the magnetic field, uh, and it's not slowing down due to friction, it's, uh, it's not experiencing any changing magnetic field inside it. right? And if it's not experiencing any changing magnetic field, then there's no torque acting on it to speed it up or slow it down. But that's all right, because as long as it's not slowing down, it doesn't uh, notice the change in magnetic field around it. However, when we slow it down just a bit, and we have a small slip just behind it, uh, it'll be trying to catch up to the rotating magnetic field. And this catching up will be what produces the torque. So that's the end of the theory. We've learned about AC induction motors. Let's go on to some questions to check you know all about them now. Question six, a three phase induction motor is constructed so that each of its three pairs of electromagnets oscillates back and forth at 50 hertz. That is the same frequency as the Australian power mains. How fast can the motor spin? Well, to answer this question, all we need to remember is that the rotor of the motor will rotate uh, around the stator at exactly the same rate as the magnetic field changes. So if the magnetic field can go all the way around 50 times per second, which will be the case if each pair of electromagnets is going back and forth at 50 times per second, then the rotor will spin at the same rate. So our answer is simply that the motor's maximum speed is the same as that of each of the electromagnets. So its maximum speed is 50 hertz, assuming it's not pushing any load. If it was pushing a load, it would go a little bit slower. Question seven. What sort of rotor is most commonly used in an AC induction motor? It would be quite silly not to use uh, this sort. Is it a permanent magnet, an electromagnet, a squirrel cage rotor, or a mousetrap rotor? Now I imagine that a permanent magnet and an electromagnet would both be capable of being used in an induction motor. If we have a permanent magnet, then we can uh, change the magnetic field across it, and the electromagnet will spin. Uh, the magnet or the electromagnet will spin as it tries to keep up with the changing magnetic field. Uh, the problem is they're not quite as useful as the other sort of rotor, which is of course the squirrel cage rotor. A mousetrap rotor is also used to trap small furry rodents, but it's not the name of an electrical device. So a squirrel cage rod consists of a pair of conducting rings joined by a set of copper or aluminium bars, which of course are very conductive. The whole thing is encased in laminated iron in order to increase the change in magnetic flux through the rotor. Question eight. An AC induction motor with a maximum speed of 3000 RPM, that is revolutions per minute, has a slip of 4%. Calculate the speed of the motor in RPM, revolutions per minute, and in hertz. All right, so let's work this out, shall we? If we have a slip of 
what's the motor's top speed? Well, if we have a slip of 4%, it means that we're running at 96% of our maximum speed, right? Because we're 4% away from 100%. So all we need to do is multiply 96% by 3,000 revolutions per minute. That gives us a pretty easy sum to work out. 2,880 rotations per minute, revolutions per minute rather. So now that we have something in revolutions per minute, how do we figure out an answer in hertz? Well, we need to remember that hertz is simply a measure of revolutions per second. So how do we change revolutions per minute to revolutions per second? All we need to do is divide by 60 seconds per minute. So 2880 divided by 60 gives us 48 revolutions per second, which is the same thing as 48 hertz. Question 9. Why is a squirrel cage rotor encased in laminated iron? Can you remember the answer to this one? Well, laminated iron is a good transmitter of magnetic flux. That's why we use it for transformers and as the iron core of other motors. So the presence of laminated iron in the rotor helps to contain the magnetic flux that passes through the motor. And because it's uh, not as conductive as the copper or the aluminium bars, itself doesn't, uh, so the laminations itself do not change the uh, electric current through the rotor of the motor. So the fact that it's maximizing the magnetic field maximizes the torque on the cage, which is good if you want a motor, right? So the laminations are to prevent eddy currents from interfering with the operation of the motor. Eddy currents in the core would simply produce a lot of waste heat and a lot of the energy of the changing magnetic field, and therefore a lot of the potential torque of the motor would be eliminated. Question 10. Lenz's law states that electric currents induced by changing magnetic flux will oppose motion, right? That's why back EMF will slow down a DC motor, for example. Explain how induction motors can use Lenz's law to produce motion. That's a funny question, isn't it? So Lenz's law opposes motion, but induction motors use it to produce motion. So how is this? Well, the answer lies in the fact that uh, Lenz's law talks about the relative motion of the conductor and the magnetic field. So the two want to become stationary with respect to each other, and not necessarily stationary with the stator of the motor. So Lenz's law states that the current induced in the rotor resists the movement of the rotating magnetic field, right? The thing is, we can't change the motion of the rotating magnetic field, but we can change the motion of the rotor. So the rotor will resist the movement of the field by beginning to rotate itself, so that relative to the motor, uh, the magnetic field through it will be changing at a slower rate. And in fact, when it reaches top speed, the magnetic field stops changing. So when the magnetic field is stationary, stationary with respect to the rotor, the rotor must be rotating at exactly the same rate that the magnetic field is rotating. And this is uh, why, of course, we can use induction motors to produce torque. So that's the end of the questions. In this section, we've learned about AC induction motors, also known as squirrel cage motors. These use uh, a squirrel cage shaped conductor in a rotating magnetic field to produce a rotating motor rotor.